everybody, welcome to this masterclass session with my friend, Dr. Mark Kovacs. Uh, he is obviously uh, a, a very, very well-known individual in the world of tennis and biomechanics and sports science. So really happy to have him on. Uh, Mark, how are you doing? I'm doing awesome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, same here. And we've got, uh, let's see, uh, John. Hey, everyone, these live streams have been excellent. Uh, great to hear that, John. Appreciate it. Hillary, looking forward to this one. Uh, same here. <laughs> uh, Nick, uh, evening all can't wait. <laughs> Mr. God of Biomechanics. Uh, yeah, so good stuff. Good stuff. Everyone's excited. So I guess I'll start off with um, a couple of questions on my own. And then we can, uh, in the meantime, you know, wait for some questions to stream in and feel free to uh, send us your questions, obviously. Um, in terms of um, tennis fitness, which area do you think is the most lacking amongst um amateur players at let's say like the three out to four or five level that they overlook yeah it's a great question it really is i mean it it's it's hard to stereotype you know millions of tennis players into one area uh people have their favorites but in general probably one of the biggest differences that you see say in pro players compared to recreational players um is the importance of of mobility training um, and then strength training. Those are the two biggest ones we see the pros spend hours and hours a day on strength and on mobility. And most recreational players don't really train those areas that much for tennis. They may go to the gym a few times a week. They, you know, they may stretch for a few minutes here and there, but they don't necessarily do it with the intent always of improving their tennis game. So I think those are the two areas that really need more of a focus is sort of a little bit heavier strength work for most tennis players can be really valuable if done the right way. Uh, and then the mobility areas, obviously, as people age, mobility is restricted. Uh, and then playing a lot of tennis throughout a lifetime also can restrict your movements, restrict your range of motion. So you have to really make sure you spend good amount of time working on that. Gotcha, uh, Mark. And I, I'm just wondering, like, why do you think that is? Is it, um, is it just not taught as much or is it like a mental thing is it like the least um uh enjoyable part like what do you think is the cause yeah i think a lot of it is just the lack of education about what's the right exercises to do i mean you know you go to a, a gym a fitness center i mean there's you know people in there doing all sorts of crazy exercises some good some not so good it's really hard to know what the right things are for you uh, and being a tennis player, especially, you have certain areas of the body that tighten up just by playing tennis. For example, internal shoulder rotation. So from this standpoint, moving your arm down like that gets restricted in tennis players. Uh, and that's one area that really uh, doesn't get enough work by most tennis players. Internal hip rotation. So your, inability, your ability for your hip to rotate internally, if you don't have good range there, it's really hard to load into, say, forehands or backhands when you rotate across your hip or when we're trying to coil on the serve, for example, if you don't have good hip internal rotation, it's really hard to get that turn and that great coil that we see the good top servers do. You can't do that if you physically don't have the range. So even though you may get coaching lessons, may watch video of pros and say, I want to do that, you don't have the same mobility as the pros, so you can't do that movement. So it's really important to not only just do general, you know, fitness training for health, and you can pretty much do anything when it comes to that. You just burn calories, add a little extra muscle by doing some resistance. That's one way of training, but then you want to do some tennis specific movements that can really help from that perspective. Gotcha, Mark. Appreciate that. And then in terms of, um, recovery uh how about there what, what what are usually the missing pieces that people uh tend to forget about with recovery most people don't recover really i mean from a standpoint of how do we you know there's a few big things that you're trying to in increase so after you play tennis what happens to the body first off you get what's called a catabolic response to training things get broken down muscles slightly tear uh that's not necessarily a bad thing but they're minor tears that happens with any type of physical activity. And it takes a certain amount of time for them to fully recover. If you don't do anything, they have a certain timeline. Let's use a number that takes 
48 hours to fully recover after a tennis match if you just sit on the couch and do nothing. If you speed up your recovery by doing certain things that improves blood flow, improves your nutrition, improves your sleep, you may reduce that 48-hour timeline down to 24 hours. So for most of us that want to play pretty regularly, it's really important to focus in on the recovery. And when we talk recovery, we really break it down. We break it down into sleep. How do you improve your sleep cycle? Doing the different things that can help with that. How do you improve your nutrition? Because adding predominantly protein, but also other nutrients during your recovery time period can help speed up uh, that recovery timeline. Then you've got things that will help with um, oxygen transportation, meaning that we're getting good oxygenated blood to the working muscles. So your legs, your calf, your glutes, uh, your shoulder, things like that that typically tennis players need. The more you can get good quality oxygenated blood to that area and then move out what we call deoxygenated or stagnant blood from an area, the faster you can move that cycle through the body, the quicker you get the good positive nutrients to the areas that need it, and the quicker you move out that stagnant blood that isn't helping anymore. And the more you can do that, the quicker you can do that, the quicker you recover. And that's what the pros have spent so much time on over the last decade, decade and a half, of improving their recovery capabilities. And that's why they're able to sort of play every week in, week out, year round nearly. And then when they're not playing tournaments, they're training super hard. So they have to really focus in on that recovery time period. And most of the kind of club players and recreational players play tennis, but probably don't do a very good job on the recovery side. And many times that's why they've always got these aches and pains and these like annoying little things that keep popping up and they're maybe not in the best shape as they can be. Part of it may be how they train, but also part of it a lot of the time is how they don't emphasize recovery. Mm, great stuff, Mark. And then in terms of you, you mentioned um, sleep and uh, you know making tweaks to that. What, what's maybe like a simple tweak we can make to, to the sleep aspect of it to uh, ensure that we sleep uh, well and enough? Sure. So there's there's about five or six things that we recommend, and this is for athletes, not only tennis players, but you know I've been working in the NBA for a few years, and we've implemented a lot of these because their sleep cycles are even worse than tennis players because of the schedule. But in general, you're trying to shut down your mind and your body that hour, hour and a half before you go to bed. So um, blue light blocking glasses is a big one because everyone's on their phones or watching TV or something like that. So you, you try to reduce the availability of blue light. So whether you use blue light blocking glasses or you just don't watch TV or don't have your phone with you, which is a lot harder for most people to do these days. So that's one. Two is we want the room temperature to be as cold as you can have it comfortably. Um, that varies, that temperature varies based on who you are, but in general, it's somewhere in the 60s, not in the 70s uh, on the on the scale, because we know that it's easier to fall asleep and it's easier to stay asleep the cooler your body temp is. Um, the third is, you know, blackout shades. So when you're at home, if you can get blackout shades or make your room as dark as possible, and then when you're traveling, I work with a lot of players that travel for a living, tennis players and other athletes, and they're always in different hotels. So we actually have um, a lot of the nice hotels now have these shades and ways to block blackout rooms, but you still have to do some tricks and tips to get that environment the way you need to. Uh, then you also don't want to eat high fat or high salt foods within about three to four hours of going to bed. It's really difficult. Um, to sleep well um, in those environments. So we usually recommend eating at least four to five hours before going to sleep. And that's hard to do sometimes as well if you're traveling based on schedule. Yeah. Uh, then that's also being hydrated. A lot of people go to bed somewhat dehydrated and that affects your sleep cycle. Um, those are all the what I call over-the-counter options. Um, and then we have a lot of other more advanced strategies that we'll utilize with, with individuals that do struggle with sleeping, staying asleep, or waking up a lot. 
Yeah, thanks for that, Mark. And uh, yeah, one big thing for me that I found through using my uh, aura ring here is that um, whenever I have uh, alcohol <laughs> at night, it uh, my sleep uh, just quality goes down drastically. Um, I was well, just actually, wondering, to, to go on yeah. that point, because a lot of people do like to to drink some alcohol at night, and usually what we recommend on that is if you can. And again, it's not easy to do, but if you can, usually try to have a two to two to three hour washout period before you sleep. So have your mm. alcohol a little bit earlier. And then the second thing is the hydration piece after. So the art, uh, you know, it is so big. So one of the strategies for every, uh, you know, um, regulation drink that you have, have at least 12 ounces of water. If you can mm. do that ratio, most people do really, really well when they try to sleep. If they don't, they get those bad responses to the sleep cycle. Got it, Mark. And and you talked uh, as well um, of of you know the schedules and you know on occasion we'll we'll obviously have like later matches and such and we'll have to eat late. So, uh, is there any uh, recommendations as far as you know quantity or um, you know type of food that will? I know you mentioned like to, it's a lot of salt and fat is is bad, but yeah, any other recommendations like say if we just have a late match and then we have to eat late as to how to approach that. Yeah, it's just hard when you have to eat, say, an hour, hour and a half before you go to sleep. It's, you know, it's really difficult because all the stuff you sort of need for the body to recover, you know, protein, some carbohydrates, even some salt, which after playing in hot, humid yeah. conditions, you want some salt. All those have a sort of bit of a negative effect on your sleep cycle. So it's real challenging. But usually if you can do it, you know, you know try, try to limit the heavy, heavy fat dishes at late at night. Um, and then the heavy, heavy carb dishes. Try to limit both mm -hmm. of those late at night. And if you have to, you, you sort of want to eat, say, a bar maybe for your carbohydrates right when you finish, then have a salad and some protein. Uh, mm -hmm. That's usually what we recommend. Or some brown rice or something that isn't super starchy uh, from a carbohydrate perspective um, because all of these can have an effect, especially if you're trying to go to sleep quite quickly after you eat and that makes and eat less than normal which is a hard balance because you've got to refuel but you also don't want to overeat because it becomes really difficult to then immediately fall asleep yeah definitely i've been on both ends of the spectrum and either i'd you know have trouble sleeping or i'd wake up at 2 a.m and have a bar <laughs> not the most fun thing but uh great so we have a lot of um comments here i'm going to read some uh let's see uh listening while i'm in the gym that's fantastic uh let's see baron um i'm in my 60s i play four times a week singles for one to two hours what stretches should i do after i play any recommendations for my off days heavy lifting i don't own the trap bar for deadlifts what can i do so a lot of questions in there. Yeah, no, I see it. It's great. Glad to hear you're playing four days a week. That's awesome. So you're playing most days, which yeah. is great. So yeah, for my yeah. stretching or mobility program, um, you know, typically what we recommend is using a a general range. Um, is however, you know, you're you're in your 60s, so you want to be trying to get about an hour if you can of, of flexibility work um, a day. Uh, if that's feasible in your schedule. And the areas we want to focus on are uh, the biggest areas that get tight when we play. Our hip flexors, they're one of the biggest. So you do your hip flexor stretching. Uh, internal shoulder rotation, as we talked about, um, that's a really important one, especially as you age. Um, then we have to stretch out our calves because the older we get, um, especially male players, the calves really tighten up significantly. Uh, and those are the big, and then the hamstrings and the lower back, because, you know, that's what one of the biggest challenges you have as you age is the lower back pain uh, and, the, and the hip pain as well. So, you know, really you need to stretch everything, but you want to focus on the areas that tighten up the most from a tennis playing perspective. Uh, on your off days, yeah, definitely doing some heavier strength work for you um, and potentially even some power training. Um, so depending on where you are physically, uh, you, you know, one of the biggest areas of research over the last decade, decade and a half is how valuable more explosive or power training is for individuals as they age. It's one of those things that you want to get someone and work with someone um, to make sure you're doing it right. 
because anytime you do an explosive or more powerful movement, there's potentially a little bit greater risk because you may do it wrong. But the benefits on the nervous system and then also on muscle fiber recruitment is really, really valuable for you. So you definitely want to have a power and strength sort of program um, at least twice a week. We know there's way more benefits doing a workout twice a week than doing it once a week. And that benefit is actually greater than three times compared to two. So three times is still better than two times a week, but the difference isn't as exponential as how big it is from two over one. So at least twice a week. Uh, and definitely the, the trap bar for deadlifts is a good exercise because you can load up the weight relatively safely um, on your lower back as long as you do the technique right. We usually recommend that over, say, like, heavier squats or something like that as you get older. Mm. It's a little bit easier on the body. Uh, lunging is a great exercise because of how precise and specific it is to tennis movements. So um, linear of forward lunges and then lateral or side lunges, those combinations. We do a circuit of tennis-specific lunges as well that helps with open stance forehands, close stance backhands, things like that. So getting some really good work on your legs and then also strengthening your upper body with mainly pulling or rowing exercises. We don't need to do a lot of pushing movements or pressing. Uh, tennis players typically do so much of that by hitting forehands and backhands and serves that we're a little overdeveloped in the front side of our body. Uh, we need to do a lot more pulling or rowing activities. So hopefully this gives you some really good ideas to help incorporate your program. But I would recommend you work with um, someone who's qualified in your area Try to find an International Tennis Performance Association certified uh, performance specialist. Uh, they're specifically trained to work with tennis athletes in your area, and that should potentially help get you on a program the right way. Yeah, 100 percent, Mark. Um, and let's see, I thought I had a follow up here, um, but we'll we'll skip that for now. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, actually, I'm sorry, Mark. So in terms of the, you, you know, you mentioned power and strength training, so with the power training, can you just, you know, for the audience, maybe kind of talk about the, how different, how the, that's different from strength training and if, if it applies like any different sort of rep ranges and sets and whatnot? For sure. So great question. So strength training typically is how much weight can you lift? So, you know, in, in a traditional deadlift, for example, if you can lift 200 pounds, that's strength training. We do, let's say, six reps of that that allows us to lift 200 pounds six times. Uh, and we're not too concerned about how quickly we're lifting. We just want to lift the weight with good technique. So that's strength training. Power training typically is lighter resistance. So you don't lift as much weight, but you move the weight faster. So you're able to produce force at a quicker speed. Uh, so it's really valuable for any athlete, but especially individuals that age, because that's one of the things that you lose the most. You lose your nervous system recruitment of your fast twitch fibers. So you're trying to recruit those fibers a little bit sooner uh, and training them the right way. So in that same example, let's say you're an athlete, you can do six reps at 200 pounds for strength. For power, you may do three reps at 120 pounds, but do it explosively, do it very quickly. And that's usually how we structure it. So it's a significant less percentage of weight that your resistance that you'll use for less reps, but you'll do it much faster. So you don't usually feel like you're as tired when you get done with the set because it was shorter and it was less weight, but you're doing it more explosively, which puts more strain or it helps to develop the nervous system to a better extent. So that's why we usually do our power movements at the beginning of our workout earlier when we're fresher, when the nervous system is as fresh as possible, then we'll move into our more traditional strength movements later in the workout. And they can actually be the pretty similar movement. They're just done with different weight and at different speeds of movement. Got it. Got it. Perfect. Thanks a lot, um, Dr. Kovacs. So let's see, Jack. Awesome. Dr. Tennis in the house. Uh, for sure. Uh, Richard, what are the best exercises to protect your knees and shoulders if you play tennis matches and drills five times a week? We're going up to five now. 
Nice. I, I love it. These 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 yeah. are real real players that play every day. Probably play more tennis than some of the pros out there. Uh, so this is great <laughs> to see. Uh, yeah. The biggest thing that you want to do to protect the knees and the shoulders, the biggest joints that have the most problems um, in in most tennis players. So to protect the knees, the biggest things you can work on is what we have these um, knee protocol programs, and we we use them a lot with jumping athletes, so volleyball players basketball players, tennis players, um, and they're really focused on the tendons. You're trying to strengthen the tendon. So we do a lot of isometric movements. So isometric movements are get a, a heavy weight that you don't do reps on. So let's say a lunge. Let's say you go into a lunge, and if you could do a lunge with 20-pound dumbbells normally, and you could do eight or 10 of those, what we would do is we would get 50-pound dumbbells, and we would go down into a lunge, and we would just hold that position. You wouldn't actually go up and down eight or 10 times. You would go down with heavier weight and hold that position for usually 30 to 60 seconds. That's called an isometric exercise. Isometric just means there's no movement. There is load. There's definitely a high force, but there isn't movement. And what that does is that puts force or load through the knee and it strengthens the tendon and it strengthens the areas around it. It also strengthens a lot of the muscles. So isometric training can't be the only type of training you do, but it's definitely valuable for joint strength and specifically tendon strength. So that's one example. Um, the other is you do a lot of hamstring and glute exercises. The reason that knees really feel the brunt of a lot of movements is because we're always decelerating and we're stopping rapidly. And that puts a lot of force into the knee. And the stronger your backside of your body is, the more protective you are for the knees. So your hamstrings and your glutes specifically, you want to do a lot of what's called posterior chain exercise training. So that's things like um, various deadlift variations. Um, you've got you know, hamstring exercises. You've got glute strengthening work. Things of that nature will make a big, big difference for your knees. For your shoulder, we also do some isometric work for the shoulder to strengthen it in, in the various areas that we need it, especially at 90 degrees and above 90. That's where most mm -hmm. people are the weakest. Um, so we want to spend some time there. Then we want to do a lot of rowing and pulling movements with the backside of our body. Same reason that we do hamstring and glute exercises to help protect our knees. We also want to do posterior chain exercises for our upper body to protect our shoulders. So that's, you know, pull downs, chin, chin ups, uh, rows, things like that with really good technique, making sure that the shoulder is protected by utilizing those movements. Also what we want on the shoulders, we want to do some muscular endurance exercises where we'll do band various band exercises with the shoulder uh, but we'll do high reps, 20 to 30 reps at a time to make sure that we have some endurance in those smaller stabilizing muscles. Mm -hmm. This is brilliant stuff. Appreciate it. Uh, and with the isometric holes, uh, Mark, you mentioned, you know, as an example, grabbing uh, 50 pound dumbbells. So do you need, um, you know, a weight? Uh, do you need heavier weights to achieve the isometric hold? Like, is it possible to even achieve that with just like body weight? Yeah, so it, it is. You have to adjust your body weight to do it. Um, so what we would do is say, put you know, one, one exercise you can do with body weight is you find a wall, make sure it's a solid wall, take your shoes off and then put your feet up against the wall like a leg press would be and then press as hard as you can into the wall for 30 to 60 seconds. So that's an isometric exercise, but so it's an isometric leg press. So you're pushing into the wall as hard as you can with your back on the ground, knees bent at 90 degrees, and you're pushing as hard as you can in, into the wall. So that's one way to get a similar effect just using body weight. Got it. Got it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bruce says, backs, knees, exercises for injury prevention. Please cover Mark. I guess you you did most of that just now, right? Yeah, so the back yeah. we could probably touch on a little bit. We talked on yeah. the knees. Um, so the back side of things. So, you know, the back is a complicated area. It's the number one area of pain in humans. It's not just athletes. Back pain, lower back pain is the number one complaint across all human beings as they age. Mm. So you're not alone. It's a normal area of concern. 
The best way to strengthen it is to stre strengthen the back, the abdominals, uh, and then also your hips as well. Uh, it's one of the big areas that don't get enough work is strengthening your hips and your legs. The stronger your legs and your hips are, the less pressure your back takes. Then also you want to look at posture. If you've got a significant lordotic curve or sway back, um, puts more pressure on the lower back. So being able to straighten that out over time with training, with posture training, uh, is really important because I see a lot of people doing planks and plank variations and different things that are supposed to be helping their back. But if you watch how they do it, they have a big sway back when they're doing it and you're actually making scenarios a little bit worse because what you're doing is training the body to put more pressure in that area instead of actually strengthening it. So we want to make sure that when you do your plank, plank variations, you really understand that your technique needs, needs to be correct. You need to suck your belly in a little bit. You need to squeeze your glutes together and you need to try to have as flat a back as possible when you do those movements. Um, also, we have some isometric variations on back exercises, just like we do for the knees. You know, planks are, are one variation. But we also want to do some flexion extension, like not a lot necessarily, but you want to be able to control flexing and extending, so crunches and things like that, but you want to do them controlled. You don't want to be out of control when you do them so you, you can you know, engage the smaller stabilizing muscles around your spine to make sure that you can control those movements. Because when you're on the tennis court, you're flexing and extending. You're reaching for balls, you're bending over, you're going up for an overhead. All these movements require some flexion and extension, and we want to strengthen those as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Uh, appreciate that. So Bilal asks, uh, what are your thoughts on CBD and THC recovery methods? So do you uh, utilize that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And yeah, we, we actually do utilize CBD quite a lot mm. um, for different things. So just so folks know, CBD and THC uh, are sometimes combined. Say in, in traditional marijuana, you've got both of them in, in marijuana. THC is what makes you high or that sensation uh, that most people get. So many products now separate those out. CBD doesn't give you that THC sensation and it won't show up, say, on a drug test or anything like that, whereas THC will. So a lot of products now are being made um, specific for purposes of um, providing pain relief potentially, which is what a lot of these things are used for, and to help with recovery and even sleep. So you just got to be a little careful with what you're getting. you got to be smart because we know the area is a little unregulated right now. It's a little all over the place with how things are done. There are over-the-counter options. Then there are medical prescription options. And some people, I think, get confused between them. So predominantly, all the things I use are mainly CBD products um, because a lot of the athletes I deal with do get drug tested for sport and for what they do sometimes. Um, and then the THC component can be beneficial there's some data on certain things there but you've got to very much be careful with your dosing and the purity issues so we'll talk a little bit more on the cbd side um, from a pain relief standpoint there are tinctures or lotions um, that can be put on certain body parts um, that can provide some relief and individuals some some people not not everyone but some people find that before bed it can actually help with some sleep cycles as well they feel like they get to sleep a little bit easier and it helps with the recovery. So again, the data is coming out. It's a pretty new area and there aren't that many large scale longitudinal studies yet. So it's a bit hard to make definitive statements yet, but there are a lot of people that utilize them and, you know, anecdotally get some benefits. Um, there's quite a few athletes that I've worked with that are utilizing it for different things that can be valuable and, and provide some benefits. So, I would just be cautious uh, about making sure you know what you're doing. Work with someone that has experience and understands the difference between CBD and THC and the products that are out there and make sure you go with a highly reputable company that has purity um, analysis on their products because a lot of companies don't and good manufacturing practices and things like that are really important when you're producing products like this to make sure your dose and purity is accurate. 
Yeah, good stuff. You probably don't want to be buying CBD off the street or anything like that. Yeah, uh, let's see. <laughs> Sherry, uh, what is a good vegetarian diet for helping us recover? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so there's no issues at all with a vegetarian diet as long as you get enough protein. The hardest part with a vegetarian diet is making sure that you get enough of the right macronutrients. So typically macronutrients are carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Um, and the hardest part in the vegetarian diet traditionally has been to get enough protein. Because if you're not eating, if you're a full vegetarian and you're not eating um, meat or, or dairy, uh, it makes it really hard to, and if you're not eating fish as well, then um, it makes it very, very difficult to get enough protein. So typically the vegetarian athletes I work with, we have no problems getting their protein count up, but we have to usually supplement with something. Um, so we'll have two, sometimes three pro vegetarian protein shakes a day to supplement their other meals to make sure that they're getting enough protein throughout the day. So there's definitely no issues with a vegetarian diet from a standpoint of optimizing nutrition, but you have to be smart. You typically can't just go and order a traditional vegetarian meal somewhere and have that as your only protein source. You usually need to supplement it with um, some nuts, um, some some different things on top of what you're going to have in your three three meals a day sort of scenario. So just be smart about making sure that you've got your know, vegetarian protein bars. You've got shakes available to you throughout the day to supplement predominantly the protein. That's the hardest thing to, to find usually in a pure vegetarian diet. Good stuff, Mark. So for somebody who's trying to maybe decide like which one should they, should they go on a vegetarian, a non-vegetarian, vegan? Uh, I mean, is there any, you know, advantage for going on one versus the other? Uh, do you have a preference? Yeah. So, I, the, the, the difficult part is I usually adjust the nutritional needs based on the dietary choices of the athlete. I'll never push an athlete into a certain diet type unless yeah. I have information, meaning that I do blood work with everyone we work with at a high level, and we do that co relatively consistently. We'll also look at our hormonal levels, um, so you'll, you'll be able to monitor hormones uh, and then for some people, you'll do digestive assessments using stool samples. So you get sort of three broad areas. You get a swab for hormonal, you get blood work for looking at the, you know, aspects of uh, electrolytes, uh, how, they, how they process uh, liver enzymes, kidney function, things like that. Um, and then you'll potentially do stool samples to look at if there's really issues uh, with leaky gut and things like that. So if you don't have all that information, it's really difficult to say, hey, this is the best diet for you or this is the best nutritional plan for you. Um, mm -hmm. People make their decisions usually based on someone else or what they've read or something like that. So they do it based on anecdotal information that they hear from someone else, which is okay. It's trial and error. Everyone does forms of trial and error. I prefer to try to have a better you know, amount of information to make decisions off. But in general, removing a food type, whether it's, let's say, vegetarian, you're removing meats and dairy, or if you're ketogenic, you're removing carbohydrates. Um, you know, there's all these different options out there that pretty much removes a large percentage of the general diet that's out there. Um, and in the short term, most of them work pretty well depending on what your goals are. You know, a lot of the time it's weight loss or it's to feel better from an energy standpoint. That's why most people adjust diet significantly. And a lot of the time it'll work because if you remove a food group or multiple food groups, typically you eat less calories. So, you know, you, you usually lose weight. Um, so that's one aspect from a weight loss standpoint. From a general nutrition and health standpoint, um, the old adage of moderation still holds some truth um, if done correctly. There's always better options. You, you want to shift into sort of the cleaner, more, less processed options that are out there. Um, but again, it's one of those things, uh, can you do it in today's society with travel, with limited options always available? So you have to pick and choose 
where you make your decisions. But usually uh, I try to base it off as much data as I can get on the individual so we know, do, are you more sensitive to certain foods? Um, doesn't mean you can never eat those foods, but you just want to know so you're going to limit those to certain times or they may be during your know, off days or things like that. So you just want to know as much as you can so you can put together the right plan. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks, Mark. Uh, let's see what else we got. Bilal, you say that about fats, but I've been on a keto plus fasting regimen and I've never felt better in my life. I know you're speaking over heavy foods at night and sleep. Thanks. Um, so yeah, more of a comment there, but... Yeah, no, no, that, it's actually, it's a good clarification. Yeah, when I was saying heavier fat foods, that's on a moderate diet for in the having carbohydrates and, and fats as well. If you're on a full keto diet, that is your fuel source is fat. So you're fat adapted. So for people aren't that familiar, if you're on a ketogenic diet, in a true ketogenic diet, it's really below about 20 grams of carbohydrates per day. Um, and that's very, very little. Um, so what your body does is it adapts to processing um, fat uh, in a more efficient way because it's the major fuel source that you have. So you shift into a very different environment. It usually takes about four weeks, uh, four to six weeks to get really fully fat adapted. Um, so for individuals that are on a ketogenic diet, th that statement I made previously wouldn't apply because that's your only option um, is fat is your fuel source. So you're fat adapted. You're used to eating that at every meal and that is your only option. Um, so yeah, good clarification there for sure. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bilal and Mark. So if, can you play, you know, sustained, um, like, you know, intense uh, tennis for several hours, you know, on a keto diet where, where fat is your only fuel source? Yeah, no, no doubt. Okay. As long as you're fat adapted. I think that's the important okay. difference that most people, most people truly aren't on a keto diet. They may be on a low carb diet, um, which is maybe 50 to 150 um, you know, grams of, of carbohydrates per day. Um, so, you know, that's four or 500 calories of carbs, but, you know, maybe 2000 calories or 3000 calories from other sources. So, and that's really low carb, but you're probably not fully fat adapted in that environment. So for those individuals, it's a little bit harder, but if you're fully ketogenic and you are fat adapted, yeah, you can function just fine on a ketogenic mm. diet. No, no problem at all. When you get to the highest levels of competition for speed and power type sports, and even for marathons, um, the data has shown that you're going to perform better with carbohydrates for those high intensity speed power activities than on mm. a purely ketogenic diet. But we're talking about the top, top, top percent. So for most people, you're not going to notice that difference because most of the people we're talking about here aren't, you know, the best in the world or what they do. They're playing tennis for fun, recreation. So you can definitely be, there's plenty of recreational tennis players on a ketogenic diet doing just fine. Right. Great to know. Great clarification there. Uh, Christopher, best exercises slash drills for increasing movement and speed. Yeah. So the biggest things to improve your movement and speed is to do movements in the, in the, the mimic, the tennis movements. So move laterally, move multidirectionally in the V drill and the X drill of, you know, from a tennis standpoint and the movements that are similar to that. So, but when I say do that, make sure that your step counts and your footwork patterns are optimized. Remember, we move faster with bigger steps, not smaller steps. Even though a lot of people feel like they want to take a lot of little steps to get from A to B, the quickest way to make yourself faster is actually to take less steps but put more force into the ground per step. So it'd be spend more time in the air. And that's the quickest, easiest way to get yourself faster from a technical standpoint. From a training perspective over, say, four to eight weeks of structured training, you want to do speed and power exercises. Um, plyometrics are, are an example of that. Various jumps in different directions with or without some light resistance, depending on where you are in your training development. Uh, those are always good. Throwing medicine balls can be really good for power development of your strokes, 
but it can also really help you with movements if you do them right and incorporate them into mimicking forehand and backhand movements and things like that. The other big one that most people don't spend enough time on is their deceleration ability. Remember, tennis is all about changing directions. And when we talk about movement and speed, we always think about accelerating or moving to the ball. We also have to stop after the ball and then recover. And if we spend a lot of time working on our change of directions via eccentric loading, we're going to really improve our change of direction time. And that's really where you make up most of your time on a tennis court. It's not always how fast you get from A to B. It's how fast you get from A to B and then back to A again. And that's the real important movement parameters that you need to work on. Excellent stuff. Uh, let's see who we have next. So, Hey, Jamie, uh, I'm 35 and playing four to six days a week. It just keeps increasing. <laughs> uh, finding that there aren't enough days in the week to do off-court training. Makes sense. Uh, two, without doubling up. Any advice for doing that safely? So that's, it's, a re, it's a really good question. And this is sort of where you want to structure your week appropriately. So there's a lot of ways you can do off-court training. You can do two heavier sessions per week and then um, do mobility and speed and power your other days. That's one option. Another option, which is more similar to sort of what I do with a lot of the athletes on the road when they're playing tournaments, which is a similar situation to this, is we're going to train every day, but we're going to do 20 to 30 minutes of something. It could be a few medicine ball drills and then two or three strength exercises um, and then some mobility. So it may be a 30-minute session on some of that. Um, so it's not enough to really wear you out, but it's enough to get loading on the body so that you're not actually decreasing your performance over time. So those are the two traditional best ways to do it. Pick two days a week and make it a longer session, say an hour, and you try to hit everything twice a week. Or you break up your routine. You do pretty much the same total number of exercises, but you break it over, say, five or six days, and you do you know, 20 minute sessions every day uh, for say five days a week, maybe a couple of days off in between, but that allows you to sort of make sure that your body is getting loaded consistently. Because one of the best ways to prevent injuries is to consistently load the body. If you go in and out of working out, that's not a great strategy. Say, hey, I'm gonna work out hard for three days this week, but then I'm off and I travel and I forget to work out for two weeks and then I come back and hit it again hard. That's the easiest, quickest way to hurt yourself. Um, if you load yourself consistently, your body adapts, your body becomes what we call more resilient. So it's like to any type of stress. The more you're exposed to it, the better your body adapts as long as the exposure isn't spikes, meaning that you don't do excessive amounts on any one day. If you just gradually increase a little bit, your body gets used to it and you adapt to it. And then every we usually recommend every four weeks, we have a bit of a download week. So we really try to back off our total volume. That's including tennis as well. So mm. let's say you play between four to six days a week in tennis. You do two heavier days off court a week. That fourth week, you may drop your tennis down to twice a week uh, and you may actually take the entire week off from working out. Um, that may be an option for you. So schedule your vacations, schedule it around, say, your leagues or wherever it is. So there's certain time periods throughout the year where you can take these download weeks. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, let's see. Uh, Frank, struggling with a sore Achilles heel. Any thoughts on a shoe type I can wear while playing? Yeah, so great question. Uh, Achilles pain and heel pain and calf pain. They're all different, but they're all in the similar you know, area of the body. And they're somewhat at times pretty related because they all sort of connect down in the same area. So this is very, very common. Um, you, you know, typically anyone over about 40 usually experiences you know, heel pain, uh, Achilles pain, calf pain. Uh, and there's a, quite a few things we want to do. Shoes are one option, obviously. The more support you have around there and the stiffer the back heel cup is um, at, uh, of the shoe, the better it is for support. Um, the challenge becomes what type of insole do you have? The softer your insole, the worse it is sometimes. It feels good when you're walking around because you've got extra cushioning, 
but your heel sinks. And when your heel sinks, it actually puts your Achilles and your calf on stretch a little bit. And when you put it on stretch, it puts pressure there. So you want to be a little careful about wearing shoes that feel really comfortable um, if they have that soft kind of heel because it, it's not ideal. The reverse isn't good either if you have a too stiff a shoe um, when it comes to an insole uh, that you feel like you're walking on a board. Uh, a little bit of stiffness is actually a good thing, but you don't want to have too much stiffness. So it's, it's hard to say a specific shoe because – Unless I know, are you flat-footed? Do you have low arches or high arches? Do you pronate or supinate with your feet? That determines a lot about what shoe you should do or should you use an orthotic. Uh, orthotics are a really complicated area to discuss either in this environment because there's really good orthotics and then there's really bad orthotics. And orthotics need to be done um, based on your foot and you know how you walk and how you run. People walk differently than they run, and most people don't take that into account either. You may walk a certain way, and then the moment you start running, your foot plant's actually different. Um, so we want to take that into account. Uh, but again, if you've got a lot of Achilles pain, you've got to deal with um, a couple different things. One, you got to loosen up your calf. That's that's sort of the number one issue is tight calves. So spend a lot of time getting that loosened up. Uh, and then you've got to try to strengthen your tendon as best you can, which is hard, but we do isometric work on the Achilles, just like we talked about with the knees. We do a lot of work on that to try to strengthen it. Um, and then heel pain is tough because heel pain can be caused by a lot of different things. It can be related to plantar fasciitis. It can be uh, related to um, spur, heel spurs. It can be related to you know, a lot of different things. So definitely – probably go see someone because you want to get it diagnosed. What is the pain? Is it really Achilles pain? Is it heel pain? Um, you know, what's the real cause of it? Then you can address it. Got it. And who's the proper specialist to see for if you have this sort of pain? It depends. I mean, there's some really good physical therapists that work in the lower mm -hmm. extremity. Make sure you go to somewhat of a specialist for that area. Um, there's definitely a podiatrist. We work with some sport podiatrists that are really, really good with the feet. Um, so those would be the, the two most likely. Um, and then, you know, there are, uh, you know, those are the two main ones. Then there are some chiropractors that are got specialty with the feet as well. So you just want to have someone that specializes typically in that, that area would work with anyone that works with basketball athletes because they deal with the Achilles and the feet so much that anyone that has a big experience in basketball is going to be very proficient in this area. Gotcha. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Farid, is creatine beneficial for tennis players? So creatine is uh, definitely something that we utilize with certain athletes at certain times of the year. Um, Low-dose creatine actually has a lot of positive effects for brain function, for muscle, for re recovery, for all sorts of things. But when we say low dose, it's actually lower than what is typically recommended on the packaging. Um, you know, there's ranges depending on the type of creatine you, you would utilize based on dosage. But in general, the benefits of creatine um, is usually muscle strength, muscle power, muscle size. And it's usually related to muscle size to start with. So we usually use it during a, you know, a strength training phase or a muscle growth phase, if that's the goal. Um, the negatives of creatine is if you have to really do a good job of hydrating. The big challenge with creatine is it pulls you know, water from the muscle a little bit and you can become a little dehydrated if you don't hydrate well. If you hydrate really well, there's no real risk to taking creatine if it's done right. But you have to do it right and you have to know your dosages. So again, if you are planning on doing creatine, make sure that you do it in an environment where you can be really well hydrated. It's usually during a training phase to start with to see how your body responds, uh, but then also work with someone who's got experience with, you know, creatine protocols because it's not as simple as just, I'm just going to do what's on the package because for a general person, it may be fine if they're not really, if they're just going to the gym and working out three, four days a week. Um, but if you're playing tennis, typically in hot, humid conditions, multiple times a week, you're exposing your body to heat stress, 
which creatine doesn't interact that well sometimes in, in hot, humid environments. Gotcha. Thanks, Mark. We have a lot of questions. Uh, let's try to get to them. Uh, Sierra, what strengthening exercises could I do for the internal hip rotation for the backhand and forehand? Yeah, so great question. So um, there's a lot out there that you can do. Um, various sort of hip lifts. So you're lying on your side, you have your leg out in front of you, point your toe down to the ground and then lift your leg up and down like that. That's one of the easiest, best ways to do something like that. That allows you to get that internal hip rotation strength up. Um, you can do the same thing standing. You stand up um, on, on your right leg you turn your foot inwards on your left uh, and then move your foot out left uh, called abduction. Um, you want to abduct your leg out to the side and then bring it back in. You do about 10 to 12 of those. You'll get a real sort of burning sensation in your hip. Um, that's a good thing. That's telling us we're working it. We're strengthening the internal hip rotators. Typically, our internal hip rotation strength is very weak. So we have to be careful not to add too much weight too quickly to these exercises because you can actually hurt yourself. So typically body weight with a little resistance, band resistance or a five pound leg weight, something like that is about what we're talking about with adding resistance. This is not exercises where we're going to add, you know, 200 pounds to it. It's going to be very incremental, you know, five pounds here, two and a half pounds, things like that. So um, if you go to Kovacs Academy and put in um, hip internal rotation, I think there's a few articles and videos on exercises that may, may help with that question as well. Excellent, excellent. See, Nick, I uh, love this guy. His, his mind has huge gigabytes of capacity. I believe this was confirmed at Kovacs Institute, actually. <laughs> no, I just, I, just enjoy, I just enjoy this stuff. And uh, the good thing is these sessions are great because you get different questions from different people. And, you, and then you go back and, you know, if you haven't seen these things, you, you, you research them. And the good thing is there's a lot of people out there doing good research nowadays. So we have the ability to find good information. And that would be my biggest statement is make sure you listen to the the science and the good information there's a lot of anecdotal stuff out there that may or may not work you may as well use the stuff that works yeah 100 percent uh let's see here tom hello again good info well presented mark i believe we met at hss in new uh, nyc where i trained as an ortho doc it was a sports med tennis conference i think you presented on your surf breakdown uh yes yes good stuff um let's see michael hey, what if <laughs> hey tom hey michael asks what if you have had bilateral knee replacements five years ago and are playing mostly singles about two to three hours a day five to six days a week what leg exercises would you recommend yeah so that's great so if you've had you know bilateral knee replacements five years ago you're in really good shape that's it's actually you know the last few years the knee replacements have been phenomenal and you're right in those early mm -hmm. stages there so you've got sort of bionic knees now which is great um the biggest thing for you is you've got to strengthen everything around it so a lot of quad exercises so a lot of lunges lunge variations um a lot of posterior chain work you know deadlifts are great hamstring exercises, glute exercises, and also do a lot of calf work. Um, try to strengthen up your calves as much as possible. The real thing we're trying to do is, you know, really protect those knees, even though they don't need protection because, you know, you've had the replacements. Um, you're in good shape from that standpoint. The biggest thing is now the muscles around it, uh, you need to be strengthened and then make sure you're doing some power exercises as well to make sure that you've got the power capacity in the now strengthened muscles to be able to utilize them on court. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, let's see here. Julian. Hi, Frank. Uh, I, oh, hi, Frank. I struggled with Achilles chronically for years. Doctors, exercises, et cetera, put nettles on and now I am pain free. Oh, interesting. What are nettles? Is that... What, uh... Let me see if it's what I'm thinking it is, because there's a couple companies out there. Um... Yeah, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I don't want to misspeak on what what those are. There's a couple things that I think it is, but I, I'm not clear on it. So if you can maybe provide a link or or 
give a little bit more uh, information on it, we can we can maybe talk about it. But that's great that it's working for you. Great to hear it. Yeah, yeah, hundred uh, percent. Frank, when I'm playing tennis, I play with a visco heel. Oh, mm -hmm. interesting. Cool, cool. Um, Baron, how do you increase wrist mobility and forearm muscle endurance? Great, great question. So wrist mobility, when we're looking at the wrist, you know, we have the ability here to sort of, do we have movement here? Do we have movement here? Do we have movement here? Um, can we move like this? This is now forearm we're getting into, you know, supination and pronation of the forearm. So all these factors contribute to that wrist and forearm mobility. So we do a lot of exercises as part of our warm-ups usually on this. So we'll do a whole series. Usually it takes about three minutes of shoulder, elbow, forearm movements like this that'll work on the wrist, that'll work on the ability to move through these ranges of motion. Uh, and if you do that every day, literally three minutes to five minutes a day, uh, it's amazing how much more range you get. And, you know, everyone talks about more lag on the forehand or we want to get a better racket drop, better cocking position on the serve. This has a lot to do with forearm movement and wrist movement. If you're restricted in your forearm and restricted in your wrist, you're not going to get as much movement or mobility there as other players. So we always spend a good three to five minutes a day uh, as part of our warm-up on this area. Um, but then we'll also do some heavier strength stuff at the end of the day, usually as a finishing set. We'll do forearm extension flexion with some resistance. Um, we'll do ulna deviation um, and radial um, movements, you know, with a racket or a weighted uh, hammer many times, or we'll put a weight on a racket uh, and we'll go through movements. And the goal there is just can we strengthen, similar to baseball batters, they'll spend a lot of time on similar movements. Um, pictures will as well because they want to get that great long axis rotation uh, after they as they pitch, same like tennis serves. So it's a great question, and it's probably an underutilized area because it's at the end of the chain, uh, but it does make a big difference, especially if we're trying to create a bit more lag or if we're trying to get a little extra acceleration through a few extra de degrees of movement. Got it, got it. Excellent stuff. Uh... Mark, I see we have, uh, it's almost six. So should we take like a couple more or what do you sure. think? Yeah, One we're, or two we're, more. we're good for a couple more. Okay, great. Um, Margarita, hi. Anything you can suggest to help increase endurance? I already play four to six times a week and weight train five times a week, but still feel like I get tired when I'm playing singles. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question and everyone gets tired playing tennis. I think that's the that's the good and bad part about tennis. It requires some pretty good endurance. My question for you would be, if you don't do anything except play tennis, you probably have an opportunity to improve your endurance. So normally with how much you play and how much you weight train, I wouldn't do any type of running or, or other load-bearing activity. I think you're getting a lot in how you, how you do things. What I would suggest is doing some unloaded tennis-specific conditioning or tennis-specific endurance routines. And unloaded means on a bike, in a pool, in a versa climber, on a rower, something like that where we're not loading the ground and we're not necessarily running. Uh, but normally the workout routines are usually 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, and you'll usually do it in a way and just to make it easy on people to remember Normally, it's a, it's a minute per rep. So let's say you do a 20-minute workout, you're doing 20 total reps. And each rep ranges in work time from five seconds of work, and then you would get 55 seconds of recovery, all the way up to 45 seconds of work, 50, 15 seconds of recovery. So every rep is a total of one minute. And we just cycle up and down that. It's pretty easy. The first rep is five. The next rep is 10, the next rep is 15, the next rep is 20. And you can just go up and then down that routine. That's easy. Sometimes we'll do it where it'll be 20 seconds of work, 40 seconds of rest. And we'll just do 20 of those. If you just don't want to think and you just want to do the same thing 20 times, that works for certain people and certain times. The biggest reason we do things like that is it's a bit more specific to tennis than just going out and running for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Because what we want to do is we want to get our heart rate up higher than what we may do in a match. 
if we're let's say we max out for someone in who's a little bit older your max heart rate may be 180 170 um that range so you may get to 155 or 160 at most when you play tennis so we may want to get above that slightly every now and then when we train off court to make sure the body can handle it and then we can recover the biggest thing for tennis endurance is our recovery can we recover quicker between points and if you don't train for that it's hard to improve it so doing a, a rotation like i suggested gives you a really easy way to do a 20 or even a 30 minute workout if you if you feel like you can do 30 reps but start with 20 reps you know 20 seconds on 40 seconds off is the easiest starting point to do it uh and see how that goes got it got it great mark uh if we have time for another one um <laughs> Uh, thanks. I was playing tennis a few weeks ago and had to serve and do overheads a lot and ended up hurting my shoulder. Do you think this injury could be more from pure technique or overuse? It's hard to say without seeing you. Um, but if you overloaded it, it could be either. Because, you know, typically if you overload something, even if it's great technique, you still may hurt it. Um, so by you saying you did a lot of them, it may just be you did way too much for what your body's currently used to. And it may not be just a technique issue, but in general, there's usually something technically that contributes to most injuries. Um, so we want to work on that. And then you want to work on strengthening those areas. So I would always go out at both. And that's a lot of what we do is we like work with the coaches, work with the players. Technically, what are you doing? What are the opportunities for improvement there? And then physically, what are you doing? And we know there's always opportunities there. Um, I rarely see a player that technically is perfect and I've never seen a player who's physically perfect. So mm -hmm. you've got the opportunity there to work at it from both areas. Got it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, <laughs> there's so many questions here, but I know you have to run. So, um, just, uh, just to let everyone know, you know, where can they go to follow you and, uh, see what you're doing? Yeah. So, uh, it's pretty easy to go to Kovacs Institute, either go to kovacsinstitute.com. Um, that's our institute page. We also have Kovax Academy, which is our member site uh, where we talk about a lot of these things and there's weekly content that goes up, short form, long form videos, articles, uh, sample programs, stuff like that. Um, those are the two easiest ways to get in touch with me. And then we also um, are involved in the International Tennis Performance Association, which is a trade association that educates and certifies individuals that train tennis athletes. So we always recommend you try to find someone in your area who's an International Tennis Performance Associated cert certified individual um, because they have been trained on how to work specifically with tennis players. They may be athletic trainers, strength coaches, chiropractors, medical doctors, but then they go through extra training on how to implement their um, skill set specifically for tennis athletes. Brilliant stuff. Um, well, Mark, I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Um, for those of you watching as well and on the replay, uh, if you want to get the all-access pass and have Mark's presentation uh, for life, then click the button over there and do that but mark um thanks so much for taking the time i know there were some questions we couldn't get get to but uh you know maybe hopefully next time uh we'll answer those but thanks a lot mark really appreciate everything you're doing for tennis and looking forward to chatting with you again soon awesome thanks for everything you're doing the summit's awesome it's one of the best events in the tennis industry so thanks so much for all the time and effort thank you very kind of you mark so thank you so much again and thank you for everybody who's watching and uh we'll see you next time take care